Each of us is on the hook to solve problems ranging from the annoying to the unsolvable. Uh, the problem with that, however, is that the word itself, problem, is an overloaded term. One word with lots of different meanings. So we approach each problem we encounter either by ignoring it or by diving headfirst into the problem-solving process. But many of these so-called problems pop back up, rearing their ugly heads, sometimes with a vengeance. Turns out most problems are not actually problems at all. So what I'd like to do is introduce to you a model for framing problems, a framework for diagnostic thinking that I'm hoping will change the way that you think about problems you encounter in the wild. As a friend and colleague of mine, Casey Tice, once said, the old way isn't going to get us to the new place. So I'd like to introduce you to a framework. The framework is uh, here on the vertical axis you see impact. And this is how bad it will get if it happens. And the horizontal axis is how difficult it's likely to be to solve. And so things on the lower left are sort of small and trivial, and things on the upper right are heinous. It's important that we use uh, different words to describe different types of problems because they alert us to key differences in how we approach solving them. Differences that enable us to take more creative, more effective, and more resourceful approaches. Words help us think. So I'd like to share with you three brief personal stories, which I hope will uh, paint the picture of how this all works. The first one uh, involves a little issue that I had. So my lovely wife, Kirsten, on date night many months ago, turns to me as we're driving home and says, Harry, I'm pregnant. I was panicked. Largely because I'm not entirely sure how she got pregnant, but that's an entirely different story. <laughs> so, recognizing the panic on my face, she, she says, oh, Harry, I'm sorry. It, it's not what you think. I, this, this thing, it has four legs. I'd like another dog. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not a problem. This is an issue. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Meet Cody, the newest member of our family. <laughs> she has a big head. So the, the next story is a, a little bit more serious, I'm sorry to say. And it involves my 14-year-old stepson, who was recently diagnosed with something called pectus excav excavatum, or excavatum. It's fr uh, Latin for um, a, a genetic condition where the breastbone doesn't grow out properly. And in, in mild conditions, it creates kind of a visibly sunken chest uh, and leaves nothing more than, you know, psychological damage self-esteem issues, stuff like that. But in more serious issues, uh, the, the pressure from the, from the breastbone and, and, and ribs can, can put pressure on the lungs and heart and make it difficult to breathe and, it, and uh, you know, possibly call leaky heart valves. And in women, can cause serious uh, complications during childbirth. So the fix is, of course, um, you, know, you install a couple of titanium rods uh, to push the chest out and leave them in there for a couple of years, which I'm sure is quite pleasant. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the question is, uh, do we do the surgery or not? It's a dilemma. Or, if it's more serious and more risky, is it a problem the doctors are going to help us have to work through? Or if the insurance decides not to pay, is this a predicament, something that he's going to have to live with his whole life? We're going to have to live with as well? The answer, it depends on who you ask. To some extent, it depends on whether you ask you know, him, it depends whether you ask the parents, us, the doctors, or whether you ask the insurance company. Well, as you move further up the line, 
as things become as, as things become more difficult to solve, as things become um, more impactful, you end up with a quagmire. And quagmires have the annoying characteristic of they get worse as you try to solve them, right? WMDs, peace in the Middle East, Ebola. I can think of a few. Can you? My last story will take you back to my childhood, where you'll meet my father. So in 1971, 35 miles northwest of Los Angeles, in sunny Malibu, California, uh, I was in uh, third grade school, you know, third grade, with, uh, with all my classmates. And, and, and my teacher, Mrs. Schwichtenberg, turns to us from the chalkboard and says, class, today we're going to practice duck and cover. Any of you remember duck and cover? So she gets up and she closes the curtains, and then she says, get under your desks and close your eyes and put your hands over your head in case the Russians send an intercontinental ballistic missile with a one megaton nuclear warhead. <laughs> this was my first encounter with the extinction level event, or ELE. That's a problem. <laughs> well, my father, it turns out at the time, during the first Cold War, was a, 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 an expert in the test and measurement of thermonuclear devices. So, of course, when he got home from work, I ran over and I tugged on his shirt and I said, Daddy, Daddy, we played duck and cover today in school. And Mrs. Schwichtenberg said that if the Russians sent an ICBM with a one megaton nuclear weapon, that after it's all over, we would drive to Ventura and everything would be safe. And my father got this very odd look on his face, <laughs> all six foot four tall of him. And he said, Harry, my son, the Russians don't have anything that small. <laughs> oh boy. Well, it turns out that, you know, the, the thing we dropped on Hiroshima, that was less than 20 kilotons. It was a small fraction of the size of a one megaton bomb, and it had an effective blast radius of two miles, and you've seen the pictures, right? And the theoretical one megaton bomb that Mr. Schwichtenberg was talking about had an effective blast radius of mm, 20 miles or so. Malibu was safe. I was happy. Turns out the Russians had a 50 megaton bomb with a blast radius of 600 miles. That gets San Francisco. So it turns out the problem-solving strategy for an extinction-level event is planning. So in closing, you know, in closing, I suppose I've spent my life trying to prove to my father that the world is a beautiful and magical place, full of possibility, and that listening with an open heart and an open mind will create new opportunities and possibilities for solving even the most difficult problems. And then, in reflecting on the broader purpose of this talk, I stumbled on something called the Serenity Prayer, the common name for, uh, for a, a prayer that was adopted by Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, authored by an American theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, and it goes something like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, and the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And what really hit me was the wisdom to know the difference. So next time you find yourself facing a problem, and before you try to solve it, ask yourself the question, is this really a problem or is it something else? If it's an issue, cope with it. If it's a dilemma, make a decision and move on. If it's a problem, aim for a solution. And if it's not solvable, figure out how you're going to live with it. Most of the time, problems are not problems. Thank you. <laughs>